Thank you for joining me, everybody. It feels good for me to be here. Maybe it feels good for you to be here as well. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe you don't feel good. Not that that's an emotion, really. Feeling good, feeling bad, those aren't emotions. Maybe you're in a difficult place right now. Maybe you feel stuck. Maybe you spent the last four hours on Twitter feeling like a victim. Everybody's out to get you. Uh, America is a failed state. Women are, are undateable. You can't get a job. It's difficult, perhaps. It feels difficult, but I would challenge you that maybe some of that is your own projection of your own psychological issues. It's all right. Nothing to be upset with yourself about. Just understand how your emotions work. Remove the barrier between you and reality. Right? Philosophically, reality is out there. I see the TV there. I see the, the TV stand. I see the light here. They're there philosophically psychologically not so much psychologically we need to relate with them we need to get on the the same frequency on the same vibration as we say out here in california also in sedona to relate with them to relate with the job to relate with the woman to relate with the the county the state the country to relate with other people. We have to get on their frequency. We have to get on the frequency of reality. And I think the best way to do that is through managing our emotions. And I think that you can do that in a way that doesn't make you look like a hysterical woman. In fact, the better you get at managing your emotions in the proper way, the less likely you are to look like a hysterical woman. So it's win-win. But first, we need to understand your emotions. First, we need to understand where victimhood comes from, why you feel stuck, why you feel stilted, why you don't feel like you can really communicate with other people. You go to a dinner party and you feel even more alone than you were scrolling through uh, Twitter for the past three hours. I think I said a lot there. But what I'm trying to say is your emotions, they matter. They direct your thoughts, they direct your beliefs, your attitudes, and most of all, your actions, your decisions. You can't have actions or decisions without emotions. Try to be unemotional. I mean, that's a misnomer. It's impossible to be unemotional. You wouldn't do anything. You wouldn't think anything. You wouldn't act in any way to get into this thing, to to get control of this thing that you want control of ultimately, your decisions, your life. You first got to get in control, not control so much, but understand, relate with this thing that you don't think matters. And that is your emotional life. And that's what we're going to talk about today through many different ways. I mean, just how do you, how do you get to that place where, you know, you're more likely to do that? I don't know. Maybe that seems abstract. It makes sense to me. If it doesn't make sense to you. Well, stick around. We're going to make it make sense eventually. I went to Big Sur this past weekend, a little weekend getaway. Um, You know, when people want mentors, or, or I think what people are looking for when they don't understand the purpose of a mentor is they want advice. And I, it's the same thing when people come into uh, the clinic for psychology. They, they think they need advice. If, I mean, you guys don't. You get it. You understand that advice doesn't get, or your neurosis isn't d- doesn't get um, advice. These are, these are two totally different things. They're in two totally different, again, frequencies, vibrations. Excuse me, I was in Big Sur, which is kind of like a, a Sedona too. A lot, of, a lot of healing crystal kind of stuff coming out of Big Sur. But your neurosis is on a completely different vibration, frequency, wavelength than advice or lectures. If you're having a difficult time with your girlfriend, I am I am not going to be able to give you advice. Even if I could give you advice, and honest, I, I, I can. <laughs> I know what the right thing to do is. It's fine. Uh, but it doesn't help anyways. That, that's not the root of your issue. The root of your, your issue is why do you need to come to some guy and ask him for what, what's stopping you from making this decision on your own? Why don't you have a clarity about the decision? Well, where do decisions come from? As I said in that ranty opening, they come from your emotions. So if you lack a clarity in your decisions, you lack clarity ultimately in your emotions. We may talk about that today with cognitive dissonance. I got lots, lots of things to talk about, but 
just because it's on the top of my mind and I just was getting goosebumps about it this morning, thinking about Big Sur and so for a mentor, people think, well, I need to get a mentor because I need to see what he's doing or I'm, I'm going to use what he's doing in his life. Okay, so I'm going to sit in on a negotiation for some big business deal. I'm going to write down what my mentor is saying to get this negotiation handled and then I'm going to use those words. Or what's the structure of this negotiation? Or how did he handle this one sales meeting? Or, or when he met with uh, what, one of the VPs, how did he handle that meeting? I mean, I've been around some pretty successful people. And I remember going into it, that, that's what I was thinking. Like, I wasn't going to sit there and take notes because that would have been weird. But I was, you know, keeping like real good track of everything that was going on so I could go home and write it all down. Just do what he does. I mean, if you want to be successful, do what the guy who who's successful, do what he does, right? That that makes the set that makes the most sense. If I have a difficult time with my girlfriend, I'm gonna to go to the psychologist who has more experience with this area and I'm gonna ask him for advice what I should do. Or I should we'll go to the internet guru pickup artist online and, and ask him what I should do. Same thing. Um But man, that's not the the, the point of hanging out with people who are where you wanna be. The point of hanging out with people who where you want to be is, I don't even know what it is, but it's just like soaking in some kind of essence. I mean, I think this is the good thing about being around children. I know that sounds, eh, you know, maybe not after America's Most Wanted and to catch a predator, maybe not the best thing to say. God, there's this trampoline park near our, <laughs> near where I live. Like just has a bunch of tunnel tracks. And I think they have some regular trampolines too, but it's for kids. You know, it's like for kids and birthday parties. But I want to go there and, and get in touch with my gymnastics path and do some uh some round off back handspring fulls. I can do a full. I I'll I'll go for a double full. Uh probably won't get it around, but I just want to go there and and do that. But I, I, I got to go at the right time. <laughs> I got to go during a weekday when kids aren't going to be there. Kids are going to be in school. Or I think I'm, I might go really early tomorrow, Saturday morning. <laughs> it's just weird though. And I want my wife to go with me, but that doesn't help. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll bring my dog and leave her. I mean, that is just, I don't know. I just feel really, uh, I just feel really uncomfortable with that. Not that I'm uncomfortable with it, but I just imagine I'm making a bunch of like, here's this single dude, like doing flips on the tumble track by himself. Like, what, what's he doing? Um, man, I got off track. But yeah, I think that's kind of the point of hanging out with children. And well, that's what I mentioned in the end of Man's Guide to Shame, uh, the ebook that you get when you sign up for my newsletter. Like, well, when you're trying to remove shame in any reasonable amount in your life, you're not going to get rid of all of it. It'll, it's okay. It's going to be there. But if it's there, accept it. You know, just accept that it has an effect on you. you know, that, that, that's the real key. But if you ever see a 12-year-old who's had a good upbringing up until that point, and he hasn't really had to deal with a lot of the issues that a lot of kids get by, by going through adolescence, and I think kids get those issues because... They go through adolescence. Not, it's not that their body changes. You know, you go to school and they talk about how your body changes in adolescence, but your mind changes. You know, you like like kids need to know that your dopamine is going to drop by half. And evolutionarily, this makes sense. When your dopamine drops, you're much more likely to to take risky behaviors. I mean, uh, I think any any person who was like a um. I don't know, like the Lance Murdoch kind of character. Who's that? Oh, yeah, Evil Knievel. Like, I'm sure Evil Knievel naturally had low levels of dopamine. So he needed to do things to, you know, feel normal. He needed to do risky things to feel normal. And that's what happens to teenagers, in a sense. Their dopamine drops, and they just don't feel like themselves. And I think we have do really bad at just initiating teenagers, 13, 14, 15-year-olds into, well, you know... This is just like things are, it's, it's just going to be different. I, I, know, I don't know. Maybe we do okay. But I, I think psychologically kids need to know that, yeah, they're going to change. And I think parents are always really surprised. You know, because parents, you know, they do their best, but it's difficult because you, you have this image of Junior when he was four, five, six, and now he's 13 and he's acting like a jerk. And what's going on? No, he's supposed to act like a jerk. Like, that's good. He's supposed to boundary test. If he doesn't boundary test, that's an even bigger problem. It's probably anxiety disorder, which is only going to come out later on. But I think there's just like this 
sense of, of being around a 12 year old kid who's had a good upbringing. You're like, Oh yeah. Like he's kind of arrogant. <laughs> he's like, he's into stuff. You know, like he has hobbies, he has interests, he'll, he'll read books. Uh, and that's kind of the point of, of going through therapy is, is to get to that point. And, and that's kind of the point to, to be around a mentor or be around somebody you want to be like. And I think that's kind of the point of walking through nature because that's what nature is. I mean, we're in this part of Big Sur. Just had this forest fire in 2016, I think, or maybe 2017. This huge forest fire. You can still see the black on some of the redwoods, the, the char from this forest fire. But you just get this sense of being around nature. Like, it doesn't care. Like, it's it's not going to, when the forest fire comes in, it's, it's not going to sit around and complain about the forest fire for the next 10 years. You know, it's, it doesn't, like, there isn't that spirit. There isn't that frequency of being in nature. The frequency is, oh, good, the fi- forest fire happened. Actually, that's supposed to happen. I know it seems terrible and Smokey the Bear and everything. That's supposed to happen for the forest to grow properly. And I just get this sense being in nature, like, yeah, you're just around a bunch of winners. And that's kind of the point of having a mentor and being around him. Not to say exactly what he says in the negotiation, but you, you, you just kind of pick up on things in a really subtle way. And if you don't ask him questions, if, you, if you're ever around, I, I know I got a question about this a couple months ago, maybe like six months ago now, which is maybe why I'm thinking about it. If you're ever around somebody who has a lot of money, you get the chance to spend time around people like that. Hopefully, if you're in your 20s or maybe mid-20s, you do. Don't ask him any questions. Don't write down anything. Don't ask him, oh, why did you say this in this one negotiation meeting when you're talking to this one VP? You know, don't, nothing like that. Just notice. Just notice and breathe in and try to re- really feel where he's coming from. And man, I think that's really the, the point of, of walking through nature is the only thing that nature cares about is winning is success and it leads to you know a lot of unseemly things i thought i just follow, started following this uh nature is metal there, there's a bunch of these accounts on twitter nature is metal account and i love it because you just get this sense like nature doesn't care about you like it was here way before you were born it will be here way like long after you're gone you're gonna be hiking in the woods somewhere a grizzly bear just may come up and kill you you know, a mountain lion will just take your face off and not care, not feel any remorse. And I, I think there's just this this sense of, even when you're walking in the woods and you don't see a bear or mountain lion at all, you just get the sense that this is what's happening. You know, like on any huge redwood that's 100 feet, 150 feet tall, however large these things are. Well, we saw this one, I think it was like, it was notorious for being a very old, very large redwood. I forget the name of it, but it must have been 300 feet tall. And I think it's at least 500 years old. And all these little redwoods, I mean, it's not just the redwood. There's all these little redwoods springing up at the bottom, you know, and it's like, man, you guys aren't going to make it. Maybe one of you will, but chances are you're not going to make it. And I don't know. There's just this sense of Perfect. In, in a way, it's a sense of perfection that comes from from being in nature. It's being around somebody who, like a twelve year old boy, is a very good upbringing up until that point, who has no real emotional issues. I mean, you know, maybe he's, he's had to deal with some hardship. Maybe his grandfather died. I don't know, but but you're not affected by it. Like you notice it, and you go on. The forest fire happens. Uh, but you're, you're, you're not affected by it. Like somebody will come out in nature and litter, but you'll just overgrow it. You will decompose it. Eventually, nature just takes care of that. It swallows it up. It doesn't care. It just keeps going. And I think there's just this really invigorating sense of being in nature. And I wasn't doing mushrooms at all. But that's really the sense I get. It's being around somebody who's really successful. Like I don't play basketball. I'm terrible. I'm never playing on being good at basketball, but I think just being around LeBron James for a day, it would it would really change your perspective on life. I mean, here's a guy who's really good at doing this one thing. Like, how does he talk with people? You know, how, how does he approach practice? How does he get ready? I think all of that matters, and I think that's what you're doing when you're going through na- nature, when you're going through the woods. 
and you're just picking up on things like, oh my God, like that, that vine, the way it, it, it grows up that, that one tree or that, that one tree fell over and now new trees are springing up from this tree. Like it doesn't stop. It's, I, to me, I mean, I, I think that's, that's why it's invigorating. It does get ugly though. You know, it does get really ugly. Uh, like a Komodo dragon eating a monkey. And, and like the thing about a Komodo dra- dragon eating a monkey is like you just see in its eyes. It's not like it ever has any emotion anyways. The Komodo dragon just doesn't care. Just does not care about the monkey. Um, and that's really cool to see. Not that it's cool to be unempathetic, but to just have that like killer instinct of I'm just going to eat this monkey and these freaking PETA protesters, they're going to make a huge stink about it and throw red paint on me. I, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm going to eat this monkey. Um, what I want to talk about today, mostly, oh yeah, uh, so there's this issue going on with men, with women. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've been talking around this issue for a while. I don't know what made me think of it. Oh, I made a tweet about this today and it did, you know, well for me, which, which means I got like two retweets and, and four likes. So that's a really good tweet for me. But I think there's it's this issue that resonates with a lot of guys. I know there's it's an issue I went through too. And it's the, it's like how to find a good girl for you. I know I did the girlfriend math, you know, date 12 girls, at least over the course of 12 months, write down seven things that you want in a girl. And then the next girl you'll find, girl you find who has those seven things, that's your girlfriend. But I think, you know, there's just a lot of vagaries there. I mean, what are those seven things? What are those seven things that you want in a girlfriend? And I think a lot of guys has have this idea, like they need to find the perfect girl. They need to find the girl with like the right politics, the right views. You like the same music. Oh, she can't be a vegetarian. And you will talk yourself out of taking a relationship with the girl you're dating to a deeper level or to a further extent into the relationship because eh, it's not exactly right. or oh, Something's a little bit off. I think there's this issue of guys wanting to find a perfect girl. I know I talked about this before, guys wanting to find an attractive, like you, you can't have sex with a girl, let's just say, unless she's super attractive. And I think a lot of this is based on insecurity. The one to 10 scale is ridiculous. That's not how our biology works. It's a one or a zero. Maybe that's a penis joke. I don't know. It's a one or a zero. Either you would or you wouldn't. When she takes your, her clothes off, do you get an erection? That's all that matters as far as looks are concerned. But as far as you know, psychological makeup and what's going to be compatible for you, there's something else going on there. And so there's this huge conundrum, I think, because, I mean, just the way that, that girls are, and a lot of this is going to be, seem sexist. If any of you guys know me, I say sexist things all the time. But just the way girls are is they aren't happy unless they're in a relationship, unless they're in a relationship uh, with a man who they can trust. Their dad serves as that relationship from zero to 18. But after 18, I mean, having a great relationship with the dad's nice, but unless they're in a relationship with a man who they can trust, a man who they aren't totally unattracted to and a man who they can also trust who has a strong boundary, then they're going to be a mess. And so it's difficult because when guys go out looking for women, They go, well, she's a mess. I'm not going to date her, not realizing the fact that the reason that she's a mess is because she doesn't have a guy in her life. She doesn't have a guy in her life she can trust. She has to pretend like girls night out with white Zinfandel is the same, if not better, like Valentine's Day. That's the same, if not better, than having a man and who needs a man anyway. So girls are a mess because guys aren't approaching them. And the reason that... Yeah, and guys aren't approaching them because girls seem to be like a mess. And this is something that I realized because after I broke up with a girl, this is a while ago. I mean, I'll admit, I was not feeling good about it. (laughs) I was like really desperate. And I started dating this girl who in my mind at the time just had a bunch of red flags. Just a real mess of what I would consider to be. But then 
I got to know her and I just dated her because I, I had no other options. I'm like, well, I'm just going to see her once a week, once every two weeks, you know, go back to the girlfriend math. Don't see a girl any more than five times in a four week period, unless you really want to take it to the girlfriend level. And she just had a bunch of things that I just thought were, were really stupid. Like she was really into law of attraction and, and positive thinking. She would always talk about her affirmations that she did. She would do yoga and that would be a workout for her is doing yoga. I, I just, it was just like, how stupid can you be that you really think that yoga is, and, but it's not only the, the fact that she was doing yoga, but she would do all like the pranayama, you know, set your intention, do that whole thing at the end of the yoga workout. Yeah, really into that. She was a vegetarian. Oh my God. But she seemed nice enough. And what I realized dating her after a while is, I don't know what happened, <laughs> but I just started to realize, you know what? She's not that bad. Like, yeah, she's in the like stupid law of attraction doing meditation, which isn't wrong. It's not wrong, but that's not a complete solution. You have to manage your emotions, which I knew even at that time was, was a real problem. But at least she's into improving herself, Right. Like she's, yeah, she's into positive thinking, positive psychology, but at least she's doing something to improve herself. Yeah, she goes to yoga and she counts that off as a workout, but at least she cares about her physical health. And yeah, she's a stupid vegetarian, but at least she cares about eating right. And I really started to, to realize like, oh, like the the reason that I'm being so critical of this girl is the same reason why she's into these stupid things like uh, like law of attraction, positive psychology, um, and yoga and vegetarianism. Because I think we're both trying to compensate for being single. I was trying to compensate for the pain of being newly single. And she was trying to compensate just for, probably for the general sense of being single and some issues that she probably had with uh, one of her ex-boyfriends. And I'm realizing, wow, I think the main, re I mean, there are other issues that wasn't going to work out with that girl, I remember, but I mean, wow, the, the main reason we're not connecting and I'm kind of keeping her at an arm's length and not really getting to know her and not communicating to her, by the way, about vegetarianism besides like maybe making fun of her, you know, just like make, make, making a stupid joke, but not really communicating to her and saying, I mean, that's really cool that you want to improve yourself, but main reason that we're not doing that, the main reason we're not communicating is because we're both hurt. The main reason you don't want to at least make an attempt to make that girl your girlfriend is because you're hurt. And the reason why she is a mess, the reason why that she's trying to do all these really stupid things is because she's hurt too, you know? Um... And this is just the nature of relationships, you, you know, like you, you get into this whole red pill way of thinking, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I just call it obvious, <laughs> but if you just want to call it a red pill way of thinking and, and you understand that the men are the leaders in the relationship. And it's not just in a, 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 a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife kind of relationship they're the leaders from the get-go. They're the leaders as soon as they say hi. Direct the first interaction. You know, ask for her number. No girl's going to ask for your number. I mean, it may happen twice a year if, if you're good looking and you talk to enough girls. Where are we going to go on the first date? Where are we going to go on the second date? How are we going to pace out this relationship? That's why I think you could go back to the girlfriend math no more than five times in a four-week period. Uh, it, it can be really healthy. You, you set the pace, you set the tone. And part of setting that pace and part of set, setting that tone is reaching out and connecting with the girl, even when she may seem on some level to be a mess. And it's a difficult thing for guys to do because as soon as you say that, they say, oh, so you want me to lower my expectations? No, I don't want you to lower your expectations. I don't want you to go out with a girl who you aren't attracted to physically, who isn't going to be a good situation for you. But I'm just challenging your notion of what is a good situation in regards to a girl. Like you think she has to be like into everything that you're into or you have to share similar politics. I, I think guys are looking for the end result when really what they need to be looking for is are, are, are the ingredients. 
Um, I mean, it's like a VC, a venture capitalist looking at a startup. Does everything in that startup need to be in place and exactly right? No, there's always issues with that startup because they're on their own. Maybe it's the guy's first attempt at starting his own business. He doesn't know exactly. You have way more experience with this, but you see potential there. You, you see ingredients for success. We're going to get into some what some of those ingredients are, and I would just really challenge you guys to look for the ingredients. I mean, I've seen it in myself. I've seen it in other guys that I know who, you know, by any stretch are are really well put together. And I, and I just hear it all the time. They're dating a girl and it's like, well, that's not exactly right. It's not exactly what I'm looking for. And, and maybe that's true to some extent, but I would also challenge, are you just making an excuse because this girl isn't quote perfect when really the only perfect girl is going to be the girl who's going to, who, who is, has been in a relationship with you for enough, for a long enough period of time. You know, that's where it really comes from. It's all directed by your boundary. And once you get that together, you know, develop your own boundary, regulate your emotions until the point where, you know, you have your own identity and you can really, you know, say that phrase, love yourself. But yeah, you can really have a healthy love and respect for yourself only after you develop a boundary, only after you really manage your emotions, make the unconscious conscious, use it in an effective way. And then find a girl who can be at least on somewhat the same page as who you are in your boundary, kind of turn her into you in a sense and then love her. That's how you love a girl. That's how it works. It's not like you meet a girl and it's love at first sight. I mean, little boys think of it that way. Um, the Beatles think of it that way. But if you really want to take a mature perspective to relationships, I, I this is how it works. It's essentially loving a girl by the transitive property. You turn a girl into you. You get her on board with what you like. But you got to look for the right ingredients, you know? Um yeah, the, yeah the, the VC is actually a great analogy. Because what else does the VC do? He gives them money. He gives them emotional resources. I mean, not that you give girls money. That's always a bad idea. But, but what's the relationship version of giving girls money? Startup money is your time, your resources. I think this is going to go somewhere because you have these ingredients. And also he gets a couple uh, seats on their board. Not all the seats. Obviously, she's still her own person, but you get a couple of seats on the board. You're more in charge of her decision making, which is what she wants anyways. And um, you turn her from a startup into a fully developed company. That's exactly how it works in relationships. Because um, it's just so easy to tune out. And whenever we have our, our anxiety issues about Oh, you know, like we've all been hurt in the past by relationships, especially, and I know this happened to me, relation, um, I've been in relationships with girls. I never should have been in a relationship with them. A lot of it was my insecurity, like really subtle neediness driving the whole thing. And so you get scared. You get scared. You don't want to make that mistake again. So you go out in the world, you you, you find a, a to, to look for a new girlfriend and you're so scared of, of you know, because you, you'll waste five years easy of your life trying to figure out if a girl's right for you and being driven by insecurity the entire time. So you go out and, and try to meet girls. And if one's not exactly right, you just say, oh, it's not worth it. Um, and, you, and you think it's your high standards when I would argue it's ultimately your insecurity. I don't know. So what do you look for? What are the ingredients? What are the seven things? You know, I, I don't. This is really much better for you to find out on your own. I would say ultimately that's why I say date at least 12 girls over a 12-month period. And it's not like you come up with definite things that you write. I mean, you do. But ultimately what you're learning there is just like, I don't know. It's very difficult to put in the words. Kind of like walking through nature. Just You can get this feeling. But you get this feeling when you date enough girls and you're like, yeah, this is a good situation for me. This isn't a good situation for me. But just some things that I found are, I mean, this is really vague, but just a sense of life, as Ayn Rand says. It's really a, a sense of what it means to be alive. Like a real sense of that 
walking through the uh, nature of Big Sur kind of feeling like, can, can you really be in touch with that? Can you really resonate with that? That, that, that thing that we all have, like, I don't want to get too mystical or spiritual here, but who knows California, right? But there's like just this impulse, this impulse for more life inside all of us. You see it most in Big Sur, no psychological issues there. You see it most in, in 12 year old boys who had generally good upbringing up until that point. Very few psychological issues there. You just see this impulse for more life. This constant, just, I don't know. It seems almost like a, a work, could be a workaholic thing, but it's just a sense of more, a sense of wanting to do more, a sense of wanting to be ever more a part of, of reality. Like, like if you suggest something that she's never done, she has this response like, oh, okay, yeah, that'll be fun. Let's try it. Um, yeah, that's a good way to tell. Like, su Suggest something that's fun that you're into and see what she says. If she's like, oh, I don't know. I'm kind of doing my own thing. Or it's just like, oh, cool. You know, and even if I don't like it, I'm, you know, I'm going to learn something from it. A sense of what it is to be alive. I think that's crucial. Now, that's vague, but again... This this isn't something you're going to learn from me. This is something that you're going to learn. I'm just trying to give you some guidelines. So when you're out dating at least 12 girls over a 12-month period, just things to look out for. Also, an overall sense of just communication, like just being on the same communication level. And again, this is subtle, and this isn't really something that you can talk about or something you can ask her about herself, but you just get when you're out on a date with a girl, if you're on, like it's just vibing, Right. Um, like I'll, I'll tell you the, the first date that me and my now wife went on, it felt like we have known each other for a really long time. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get too weird, but it felt like we knew each other in a past life and it, we were, all, we were just continuing a relationship that we already had just got right into it. Now you got to be careful because that's usually a result of having very similar childhoods and coming from a very similar kind of culture, which we which is true for us. Um, so you got to be careful if there's been any trauma in your past, especially, I mean, trauma is fine, right? But unresolved trauma, trauma that you haven't worked through in therapy, you got to be careful because if you have unresolved trauma and you go out and meet a girl and you have that, oh, it feels like I've known you in, in a past life, then chances are she has very similar kind of trauma too. I would say fine girls had a similar upbringing, but I think a lot of that's going to come out in this communication. How... Um, in step are we are we in our communication because that's really going to matter later on when you're in a fight and you can at least communicate to her and she can see it in the very least where you're coming from if you don't have that from the first date chances are when you're having a fight three years four years in it's just going to be that much more difficult but i don't know i just saw this guy's tweet a while ago on twitter and he's like just uh, complain about girls being a feminist or girls being feminist like yes yeah, single girls are going to be feminists they're hurt they're in pain you know they don't have a man in their life who they can trust they're going to get on stupid social trends they're you know they're they're going to vote for stupid but they're probably going to have really dumb politics they're going to be feminists they're going to believe in stupid things they're, they're going to go to yoga and think that's a real workout they're they're in pain and that's the kind of I think mindset ultimately that you need to bring to meeting girls is she is in pain right now. Your future girlfriend, your future ex-girlfriend is in pain right now. She's sitting in a park somewhere, reading some book, doing sketches in her sketch journal, and she is hurting right now. You know, she just got like a new Bloomingdale's credit card. You know, something freaking stupid. And she's in pain. She's hurting right now because no guys are coming to talk to her. The guys who are coming to talk to her, they're drunk. They're stupid. They can't talk to her unless they get a couple beers in them. And that's not what she wants. Might be fun. It might be a fun distraction. I don't know. But that's not really what she wants. And she's in a lot of pain. And she doesn't even know she's in pain. She doesn't even know. Like the David Foster Wallace, this is water. It, you know, it might just be such a persistent continuous part of her experience that she doesn't see it as any other way so just pain she just accepts that as part of as part of existence i mean you're saving her in a sense like i know that sounds like 
like super condescending or super patronizing, but that's what you're doing. But also she's saving you, you know, and, and you have to come, you have to, to let yourself see that. And I think if you're too focused on to, oh, her hair is kind of stupid. Oh, does she dress that way? Oh, she's wearing Doc Martens and she has those stupid pants on. You know what she, that's not, that's not like a really feminine. I want a feminine girl. That's not a feminine outfit. I'm not going to, okay, maybe, maybe, but you still, you got to see through that. You got to see through to the core nugget of, of the woman who she is. And I have to realize that maybe the reason she's wearing those ugly sandals is because you know she's she's got nothing. Her friends, her friends are going to tell her that those sandals, oh, they look so cute. You know, deep down, they, they know they don't look cute. They just don't want her looking more attractive than them. So they're just going to say that. Or she's going to wear those ugly jeans because, yeah, her friends are going to say something or she's not going to dress as feminine because it's vulnerable to be feminine. So she's not going to dress. The only single woman who dress feminine, who wear like that mod cloth feminine thing are ugly. They're fat and ugly, right? So they're not as vulnerable. So, you know, they're less likely to be um, the victim of perhaps a dark side of, of male sexuality. The perfect girl doesn't exist. You make her perfect by being in a secure attachment with her. And that's going to come from you. And why is that the way? Well, because that's the way that nature is. Because men are the leader in relationships. Um, Except maybe later on in the relationship, the woman guides and directs the emotional intensity. But that's, you know, after a while. Especially in the beginning, the man's the leader. It's his boundary. It's his boundary that she takes on like an umbrella or, or you know, seeking guidance under, under a large oak tree. Um, and that's where her strength comes from. It's just my views on perfect women and, and where they really come from. And uh, you got to make them, guys. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but, you, but you know, you got to make them. All right. I have a few things to say about cognitive dissonance. People were talking about this a lot recently because of the climate strike and pointing out cognitive dissonance in in the climate protesters. So, hey, you guys say that you care about the climate. Why don't you actually do things that change the climate? Here are some concrete steps that you can take that may be maybe beneficial for the climate, like, you know, using these light bulbs. Uh, putting the right amount of air in, in your tires, right? Like really logical. Oh, you want to save the climate? You know what makes way more sense than going to a stupid climate protest? And you see the result of those climate protests. Just a lot of trash. It, it just looks like <laughs> it looks like uh, Woodstock a day later. It's just like a total, it, you know, it looks like a third world country that <laughs> came through that park. So there's cognitive d- dissonance here. You hold two separate views. You want to help the environment, but also all you're doing is going to these protests that don't really help anything at all. And cognitive dissonance got to start, uh, I forget, I think the guy's name is Fitzberger, Murray Fitzberger. Anyways, he was a social psychologist back in the mid 20th century. You know, he, he called attention to what cognitive dissonance is. And I think it is a real thing, but because he was a, a social psychologist, because he was a researcher, he only looked at the surface of what cognitive dissonance is, and he didn't look at the underlying causes. And that we're gonna—that's what we're gonna do now—is actually understand the, the root behind cognitive dissonance. So when you see it in your own life, you can understand what's really going on. So more examples of cognitive dissonance. You can't do a video on cognitive dissonance without talking about smoking, can you? You want to smoke, yet you know. That smoking is bad for you, yet you're still smoking. Well, there's two separate thoughts. I like smoking, but also I know that smoking is bad for me. And so what do you do? You minimize, you trivialize, you rationalize, you say, well, it's not that big a deal. Or in other uh, instances, you know that talking to girls is good, but you go to, to approach a girl or talk to a girl and you can't do it. I mean, what guy hasn't been in that situation? Okay, I know on one level, 
I need to ask a girl out if I ever want to get a date. If I ever want to get a girlfriend, I'm going to have to make the first step. That's just how this works. Yet, there's this girl in math class who I like. Okay, I'm going to ask her out on Tuesday. Tuesday comes 95% of the time. You don't ask her out. Holding two supposedly contradictory views, eating meat, similar people who say they're vegetarians, they're not vegetarians. <laughs> that girl who, who I dated who was a vegetarian, she was like a vegetarian 90% of the time. And it's usually a truth with a lot of vegetarians, they end up eating meat at some point. Uh, you don't want to eat meat, it's, it's, it's murder, yet you still do it. And I think Jordan Peterson, rehab. This is not, I was going to talk about this last week when I talked about Jordan Peterson, Take responsibility. It's good to take responsibility. Yet it's clear if you're an addict, you are not taking responsibility in that moment. And I think that that when it comes to addiction, you really see the nature of cognitive dissonance is that there is this emotional component to it. And I think when we really want to understand what it is, it's you don't hold two contradictory viewpoints. That's not what cognitive dissonance is. That's what it appears to be. And if you're that Fitzberger guy and all you are is a social psychologist researcher, you're just looking at the symptoms, not the underlying causes, no theorizing about what psychology is and where thoughts come from. If you're just looking at the surface, if you're just in a, in a lab with a you know, note, uh, notebook and pen or, or pencil, that's not really thinking about psychology. That's doing research, that's collecting information, but that's not really thinking about psychology. And I would argue that it's essentially impossible to hold two different thoughts, two different beliefs at the same time, two different attitudes, and still act. When you see people actually hold two different beliefs, two different thoughts, two different attitudes, you can't act. You can't do anything, right? To go back to what I talked about at the beginning of the show, where do decisions come from? Where do actions come from? Well, they come from your emotions. And unless you have clear emotions, unless you're very clear about why you're doing things, where your motivation is coming from, you're not going to have clear, consistent action. You know, doing, you, you can't do math homework. You know, you can't do the calculus homework. You, you sit down to do it, but you find you get lost in, on YouTube in 15 minutes. And the reason is, is you don't really want to do the math homework. What you really want to do is maybe get back to your father. Right, You have resentment there, and you can't bring the resentment up to your father. You can't communicate with him in a clear way, but you can get back at your father by failing calculus. It's impossible to do something if you have conflicting views on it. What's really going on in cognitive dissonance is you have one real belief and then an emotional payoff. So with smoking, oh, I know it's bad, but I still want to do it. But why do you want to smoke? You want to smoke because of the emotional component. I want, ultimately, is an easy way to manage anxiety. Because I don't know how to do it. I may not even know what anxiety is. Like the, like the single woman who says that she's in feminist, who's in a lot of pain. She may not even know the pain. You don't even know what anxiety is until you really manage it in an appropriate way. And then look back and go, oh my god, I was in so much pain. Of course I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. It's not two thoughts that you hold, contradictory thoughts, is there's one main one that you're unaware of. Or talking to girls is good, yet I still don't do it. What's really going on there? Are those, are those, are those two real contradictory views? No, it's one. The one view that you hold is I actually don't want a girlfriend. It's too scary. I'm not comfortable enough with myself to have somebody that close to me. I'm barely comfortable enough with myself to go out on a date with a girl. And I'm definitely not comfortable enough if we are on that date and it is going well. I'm not comfortable enough to kiss her. I, too much of me will be exposed. I can't look at myself. Really what I want to do is I want to hide. That's what's going on. You profess that you want to talk to that girl, but you don't. You just say that because it's the right thing to say. Same thing with the climate change protest. Do you really want to fix climate change? No, you don't. Because every action you're taking, and this isn't criticism of, of anybody. It's just understanding 
Well, I'll get to it, but just be, just to be clear, this isn't criticism of the climate change protesters. It, it's, I'm not criticizing them, but it's a great example of what's going on. Yeah, that's why people are talking about cognitive dissonance. Do you really want to change the climate? Do you really want to help the earth? Or do you want an excuse to be part of the crowd because, like the guy in smoking, being part of the crowd is a great way to manage anxiety. It's a great way to distract yourself from your own issues. If it wasn't, then you there's no way anybody would leave that much of a mess at any of those climate change protests. If you really cared about taking actual steps to fix the climate, if there is a problem, that's not for this show to decide. You would go. You would hand out flyers to get people to make sure that there's enough air in their tires. You know that would save way more in gas and pollution than any than any silly climate protest or any law that may get passed as a result of that. Jordan Peterson in rehab taking responsibility is good. Yet you have this anxiety that you need to manage clonopin, like being part of a crowd, like smoking. It's a great way to manage the anxiety. That's what you really want to do. Do you really want to take responsibility? No. Now, obviously, going to rehab is part of that responsibility. I get that. But when Jordan Peterson talks about responsibility, he doesn't mention that. He just says either you take responsibility or you don't. It's good to take responsibility, so that's what you need to do. Great. But taking responsibility, in truth, is a process. As Jordan Peterson is finding out. And sometimes when you make the decision to be responsible, you can't make that decision in the moment. There are deeper issues there that may look like cognitive dissonance on the surface, but that's not what's going on. Ultimately, what's going on is you have emotional issues there that are unaddressed. That's the issue. So what's the what's the takeaway here? Um, at least consider... I'm not saying this is happening 100% of the time, but at least consider that if there's something in your life that isn't working out, whether it's school or this girl that you want to date or just dating a girl in general or, or a job, and it's not working out the way you want, at least consider, at least have the self-awareness to consider that you actually don't want that thing to work out. There's this girl in math class who you want to ask out, but you just have a difficult time asking her. You can't bring yourself to do it. At least consider that you don't want to ask her out. What happens as a result of that? Well, you feel like an idiot. You feel like a loser. You you, uh, you get really critical of yourself. And then you go home that weekend and, and play video games the entire weekend. Maybe that's what you wanted to happen. The climate change protest. You go to a climate change protest, doesn't seem to do anything. You have a bunch of these, nothing really matters. We pass these laws. The only thing that really cleans up the environment is technology. At least consider the fact that you don't care about climate change or a clean pollution for your earth. Maybe you do to some degree, you know, like the guy wants to ask out that girl. Maybe you want a girlfriend to some degree, but maybe you want something else more. And I would argue that something else that you want is that benzo hit that you get from being part of a crowd. Um, if you want to be a vegetarian and, and you, you're only a vegetarian 90% of the time, at least consider the fact that you don't really want to be a vegetarian. You just want to be the kind of guy who talks about being a vegetarian in a party. You're not defective. Nothing's wrong with you. I'm really, I'm, I know it seems like I'm being critical of these people. I'm really not. But just understand why it's not working out. That's the important thing. And understand the emotional payoff that you get from it not working out. You know, there's no dissonance there. There's just motives that you are unaware of. And I would argue a great way to become aware of these motivations is to understand your emotions and how they work. You're not irrational. It it does make sense. You know, if you don't ask out that girl in math class so you can go home and play Fortnite all weekend, that does make sense. That's not irrational. But the trick is, is that emotions, they have not a rationality of their own, but they have premises of their own. It's not premises we're, we're used to, right? Like when um, McConaughey in the end of Interstellar goes into the Tesseract, goes into the five-dimensional Tesseract so we can understand his three, four-dimensional world in the context of five dimensions. That's that's what going into your emotions is. 
like it doesn't really make sense. And once you're in there, it, like it, it doesn't really work out. But once you're in there, you can do things that you that you never thought possible, and really understand your motiva- mo- motivations for really doing what you do. And when things don't work out, it's you don't just chalk it up to cognitive dissonance. Oh, that's just something we do. And then we rationalize away one of these thoughts or beliefs because of harmony. That's not exactly what's going on. There's an emotional component there, and until we understand the emotional that emotional component, you're never maybe understand the dissonance to some degree without it, but you're never going to be able to really manage it and fix it. So when you say, I want to ask out that girl, you do it. When you say, I want to fix the environment, you can do it. Because it's what you really want to do because you are aligned with that thing. And we'll leave it there. Thank you guys. Um, and yeah. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Animus at animusempire.com. I have a backlog of questions I know. I'm I'm, I'm working on uh, getting those answered, but I'll release those on YouTube. But at least now you know that, hey, if you ask me a question, it's going to get answered on YouTube. So, or it's going to get its own YouTube video. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, like and subscribe. Any questions, again, animus at animusempire.com. Any comments, leave them in the comment thread or email me. I, I appreciate both. And I'll leave it there. Thank you guys. And I'll leave it also with joy and pain that comes from being in touch with reality.